uh, get started when you're ready. All right, I'm ready to go. So um, my name's Kathy Newton. Uh, like everyone said, I've uh, done the laws and regs portion for your CEU credits for the last few years at the uh, station in Overton. And um, I enjoy working with the nursery greenhouse group. Um, you guys always are very astute and have lots of great questions. So, um, and like I think Erethon just said, uh, if you've got questions, you can put them in the chat and I'll leave a couple minutes at the end and we can go over them or if you um if you've got something pressing we can try to uh answer it at the time too but um i'll go ahead and get started this is not um there's not a whole lot of new as far as federal or state regulations well there's basically nothing new so this is all going to be mostly a review of um state and federal laws and regs uh, as it pertains to pesticides. So I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna turn my camera off so we can just look at the PowerPoint and um, we will go through that. So I'm a pesticide inspector in the region two area. I don't know since we are on the World Wide Web if we have anybody who's maybe not um, part of the normal kind of East Texas group, but uh, our, Region two offices in Dallas. Um, I am in the Western part of our region, which is Tarrant County West, but I do um, get out to East Texas rather frequently. And I like to get out there. You guys have, you guys got trees out there and that's nice. So, um, but I do enjoy working with nursery greenhouse folks and um, answering questions and helping you guys with any issues you have regarding to TDA laws and regs. So, well, okay, so let's see if my screen is going to let me forward backwards technical difficulty with the PowerPoint. Should be able to, it won't uh, register the mouse click. Uh uh. Uh, like forward or back arrow on your no, keyboard. No, not doing that. Why not? Maybe that's the, is that the end of your presentation? There it goes. Oh, there, we there go. it goes. Okay. <laughs> I don't know why it liked it that time. All right, hopefully it'll keep it up. Okay, so this is just an overview of. Uh, the topics we're going to go over. We're going to talk about licensing and CEUs, record keeping. We'll go over WPS um, a little bit. I'm, I'm not going to focus a whole lot on it. I know um, most people that are on this uh, meeting are going to have to comply with WPS compliance, but I, I really beat that dead horse a lot. Um, so um, We'll go over it, but it won't be just, you know, in all of the nuts and bolts. And then we'll talk a little bit about pesticide labels and disposal. Um, I've got a couple of slides on here about phytosanitary certificates. Um, that is a separate program outside of the pesticide program that I work in. So I have to admit, I'm not real up to speed on that, but I do have some contacts and some information and a website you can visit to get information about that. Um, but we will touch on that a little bit. Okay, there it seems to be working. Okay, so these laws and regs that we're talking about, these are both federal and state. The federal laws and regs, that's all governed by EPA's FIFRA law, and that's the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, Rodenticide Act. So that law is the law that regulates pesticides in the U.S. Uh, all the way from manufacturing and registration of pesticides, pesticide labeling, um, licensing and certification of applicators, and the federal worker protection standard rule. In addition, each state has their own laws and regs that go along with FIFRA. And in TDA, that's part of the Texas Agriculture Code. Um, <clears throat> some laws in the states will be more restrictive than the federal laws, but they will not be less restrictive. So I like to share this uh, definition of a pesticide. This is EPA's definition that we use when we're speaking about pesticides. I like to bring it up because when we use the word pesticides, I think a lot of folks um, equate the word pesticide with insecticide which pesticide is just a blanket term for all of those um, substances or mixtures that are going to kill or repel any pest. So that it does include insecticides, but it also includes herbicides and fungicides and antimicrobial 
products like your Lysol sprays, which we're all using a lot of these days, and plant growth regulators, uh, and rodenticides. So it's a broad term. Um, sometimes when I ask folks, you know, I'll call them or for whatever reason, I'll ask them if they've made any pesticide applications and they'll tell me, no, 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 I don't ever do that. I never made a pesticide application. Um, but then come to find out they, they make plenty of herbicide applications. So I like to mention that just so people know when we use that word pesticide, we're really, we mean any of it. Anything you're trying to kill uh, regarding your agricultural um, growing operation or establishment. Okay, so we'll talk a bit uh, about licensing right now. And if you're getting a license or you have a license, um, you know, the first step in that is to determine whether you need a license or not. And you can do that by looking at what pesticides you're using or need to use and determine if those pesticides require a license. So that's gonna be based on the classification of the pesticide. And there's three general classifications. There's restricted use pesticides, state limited use pesticides, and general use pesticides. So TDA, we regulate all classifications. We're not just limited to the restricted use. We do regulate the general use ones as well. So restricted use, these are the ones that are federally restricted. Um, EPA has determined that anybody anywhere in any state needs a license to purchase and apply these products. So you must have a license to use these. Uh, the good thing about the labeling on restricted products is that they're very clearly marked. And you can see at the top, it's always gonna be on the front of the label, usually right up at the top in bold letters, it says restricted use pesticide. So if your product is labeled like that, you know you need a license to purchase and apply it. Now state limited use pesticides, they are not federally restricted, but in Texas, um, Texas has determined that they want it to be restricted for use in their state. So you do need a license to purchase and apply this in Texas. Um, if you go to Oklahoma or several other states, that's not the case. But in Texas, you kind of treat it as far as licensing purposes goes, just like a restricted use product. Um, you will see on this particular product, this is Weed R64, it's a 2,4-D product. It does not have that restricted use indicator at the top of the label. So state limited use products are not gonna be labeled like that. You just know that they are state limited use based on their active ingredients. And see in this one, this is 2,4-D. And then here's the list of all of the state limited use products. Everything with our little flower asterisks next to it, they're all herbicides. So with the exception of the M44 and the LPC, which are like your sodium cyanide predator controls, and they're not used very widely at all. All these other herbicides, they are widely used. And so looking at your label, if your product has any combination of these active ingredients in it, in a size larger than one quart liquid or two pounds granular, then that makes it state limited and you need a license to purchase and apply it. So the larger container size, which makes it you need a license that's really um, intended because those are the ones that are going to be used by the agricultural community or uh, in a professional scope. You can purchase these products in quart size or smaller containers all day long at Home Depot or Walmart Garden Center, you'll find Trimec there, which is a combination of a couple of these actives and you don't need a license and you can buy a hundred of them if you like. But once they get in that larger uh, than a quart size, then they become state limited. Okay, and then of course we have just our general use products. Um, no license is needed for purchasing or applying these products. 
um, like your Roundup or anything you would buy at a Home Depot or Garden Center store. Um, there's lots of other ones like uh, MSMA, for example, is a general use product. There's no license uh, needed to purchase that, um, which a lot of people do get confused on and ask me about that one. Um, it has very limited scope as far as the application sites where it can be used and the quantities that can be used in, but it is a, a general use product. So once you determine, you know, whether you need a license or not, if you need to use any state limited or restricted use products, you will need a license. And there are a few different license types at TDA that you can get. And it's depending on what you're gonna use it, where you're gonna use it. So if you are only gonna be making applications to your property or the property of your employer, a private applicator license is what you will want to get. That license is good for five years and it's a hundred dollar fee. And um, again, if you're gonna just do it for yourself, that's the license you want. Um, I think a lot of you folks in the nursery greenhouse industry probably have private licenses. Um, usually when I do these uh, in person, I like to kind of see a show of hands to see um, what kind of license holders we have. And I think a lot of you guys probably have private licenses um, and there's probably some commercial and non-commercial as well. Now, if you're gonna do applications for hire, um, that's a commercial license that you're gonna need. And that's what our lawn care industry folks they have commercial licenses, um, crop dusters, anybody you're gonna hire to come make an aerial application or a ground boom application to your pastures or your fields, they'll have a commercial license. Commercial licenses are good for one year and there is a business insurance um, requirement for that license. Next, we have a non-commercial license and the way that it, it reads in our laws and regs is that you want this license if you don't fit into the above categories. <laughs> so basically, if you're if you're not just using it for yourself or your own property, but you're not necessarily doing it for outside hire for customers, uh, there is the non-commercial license option. It's also good for one year. Um, folks who work and make applications on golf courses, uh, vegetation management crews, um, those are the folks that use non-commercial licenses. And then there's the non-commercial political license. That is for employees of cities or other municipalities and political subdivisions. Um, your parks and recs department and folks uh, taking care of the ball fields. Um, myself, folks in extension, we work for the state. We have non-commercial political licenses and those are also good for one year. Something to remember with a non-commercial political license, if you have that license, um, say you work for the state or the city, that license is only good for your use in your employment. So you can use it um, in the scope of your job and your work. Outside of that, you cannot use it to go buy Grazon Next HL to apply to your pasture. So if you also need to do or to have a license to do applications on your own property. In that case, you would also want to have a private license and you can have two different types of licenses. If you have two types of licenses, your CEU credits will count for both licenses. Okay, so of course, when you're licensed, you are required to keep application records. Um, no matter what the license type you have, you need to keep those records for two years. Private applicators, you only have to record your applications of restricted use and state limited use pesticides. Everybody else though, the commercial and non-commercial, we keep records for all applications, even spot treatments of Roundup, any pesticide application you're gonna keep a record for. And then of course you all, we all have to get our CEU credits in order to renew our licenses. So the private applicators, you need 15 CEUs over that five-year period. And you're going to need two laws and regs units and two either IPM or drift. So um, you'll see on this, um, 
this is the rule that 10 hours maximum of those can be online courses and five hours must be live classroom CEUs. That is being waived at the moment um, because of the pandemic situation and the restrictions are meeting in public. So TDA right now has, they're waiving that. If, if you get all of your CEU credits and they're online, that will be just fine. Um, as far as I know, there's no end date on that. Um, probably for good reason. Um, not, I'm sure at some point when they decide that they're gonna go back to the way the rule reads, they'll let us know and we'll, we'll get that information out. But, but for right now, there's no restriction on how many online CEUs you can get. Hey, Kathy, uh, Airfon here. And just to clarify again, sure. so like a, this live webinar uh, counts as live, right? Like it's not an online, it's not considered online or a self-study. Is that correct? As far as I know, yes. Um, but like for instance, with these commercial, uh, commercial non-commercial folks, it's, you know, it's supposed to be every other year you're allowed online credits and then, you know, you kind of have to go back and forth between classroom credits, that they are allowing all online credits to go back to back. Does that make sense? Yeah. So from your understanding, even like live webinars like this in the traditional sense would not count for live CEUs, do you think? I I think they would count because okay, yes okay yeah as far as I know um, they have not told us otherwise but um, that that is my understanding yes yeah that was the understanding I got too so um, th these live webinars are considered basically live like they're not considered like online online um, right yeah okay yeah that's a good question thank you yeah okay so. Um, We'll move on. So, okay. So basically when you're getting your CEUs, you just get your CEUs and then you're ready to renew your license. You do not have to send TDA any kind of proof, um, copies of your certificates that you took the CEUs. It's, it's kind of the honor system. You're self-certifying that you did the CEUs you were required to do when you renew. So periodically, TDA will conduct audits of CEUs. And a lot of times um, they are just random. They'll just pull random license numbers after a renewal period. And they'll send out a letter that says, hey, you were supposed to get CEUs in order to do this renewal, send us copies of your certificates. And if you ever get a letter like that, you'll just send them a copy of your certificate and you'll be good to go. Um, if for some reason you get a letter like that and you either just don't reply to the letter or you do not have any CEUs to show for your previous renewal, TEA can issue a $600 fine. And they're, they are not messing around with these CEUs. Um, if you get 50% or less of the required CEUs, that could be $400, 50% or more, it'd be a $200 fine. So of course, um, with these groups, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir. You guys know this already, but I just like to share this information so you can pass it along in the event that uh, someone you know maybe has missed out on a CEU opportunity if they had. Like for instance, um, some counties are still doing live CEU classes in person or they were scheduled to, like I have one next week, I was scheduled to go do in person, but because of uh, new county restrictions, they've had to switch it quickly to an online format. Well, if some people can't um, can't make that happen, you want to make sure that you, know, you spread the word and let them know that they will want to either hop onto another online course or find another way to get their CEUs. Um, because I have had also several folks uh, ask me or tell me that they heard that TDEA is waiving the CEU certificates this year because of COVID. I'm not sure where they got that information, but that's definitely not true. They are not waiving any CEU requirements. So um, make sure you get them and let your friends know that they need to get them as well. 
Okay, so we're going to talk about record keeping. Um, record keeping is, is a real common area of non-compliance um, that we come across just doing routine inspections. So um, I'd like to go over that and clarify some things. So of course, records are to be kept for two years. We will never ask to see beyond two years. A lot of people prefer to keep longer just for your own record keeping, and that's fine, but you don't ever have to show us anything longer than two years worth of records. You can keep them in whatever format you prefer. We do not regulate how you keep the records, just that you keep them and they have the information we want on them. Some people choose to use, you know, paper, spiral notebooks. Uh, some people make spreadsheets. Uh, there's some uh, software programs that a lot of the lawn care industries use um, for record keeping. Whatever you're using is fine. As long as all the information is there and if you are keeping them digitally, uh, just make sure that you have the ability to print them if we request paper copies of them. Okay, so the items you need on your records for each application we need the date and the start time of your application. We do not require the end time. Some people like to put that there and that's fine, but we do not require the end time on state record keeping. We need your weather data. So that's gonna be your wind direction, wind speed and air temperature. Of course, if you're doing applications indoors, like inside a greenhouse, you are exempt from the weather data. We need the location of your application, and that's usually going to be whatever address. If, if you don't have an address, um, like say you've got a certain field that doesn't have a 911 address, you can use GPS coordinates. Um, lots of folks will print out maps to keep with their records, which is great. Um, if you have a FSA aerial map or even a, a Google Earth map that's accurate, and you can outline the fields that you are making applications to that works just fine too. Okay, then we need the site that you're treating and that's that's the, like your crop that you're treating. So if you're making an application to treat pests on your cotton or your poinsettias, just let us know which one you're putting there. And that is something that goes back to the pesticide label. You wanna make sure that your pesticide that you're using lists your crop on its label. We need the total area you're treating, either in acreage or square footage or linear feet. We need your name and your TDA license number. And if you have someone who is making applications under your supervision, we also would like their name on the record as well. We need just a very brief description of your equipment type and that can be a boom sprayer, airplane, backpack sprayer, just very basic, no makes or model numbers needed. If you are working in a regulated county using a regulated herbicide, um, you're going to have a spray permit for that application and we will want to record that spray permit number as well. Um, my county is out where I am, further west and of, uh, where Overton is, none of my counties are regulated. So I don't, I don't deal with spray permits too often and I'm not exactly sure which counties in East Texas are uh, required to do spray permitting. If you have questions about that, you can call our region office and they can help you get a spray permit. Uh, if you're a commercial applicator and you're doing an application for hire, we would like the name of the person who has hired you, your customer's name on the record. And then we need your pesticide information, and that's going to include the exact pesticide brand name, the EPA registration number of the product, and then your mixing rate, that's your rate of product per unit, so that might be one ounce per gallon or one pint per acre, whatever your label lists is the rate. This one here, uh, this one gets people a lot and I think it's confusing people because the wording must be confusing. But the way it is worded in our regs and on our record keeping form is the total volume of spray mix, dust, granules, other materials applied per unit. So that, that's your tank mix. That's everything in the tank including water, surfactant, pesticide, everything. 
I think what a lot of people think we're asking is for the total gallons that you used. So they'll write down something like 200 gallons. What we're asking for is your application rate or your calibration rate. Um, so it's gonna look more like 10 gallons per acre or two gallons per thousand square feet. Um, we wanna know how much went down per unit of measurement. We're not so concerned about how much you use total. And again, that all goes back to the pesticide label because some labels will be pretty specific about the application rate. They might say something like, do not apply less than 10 gallons of total mix per acre. Okay, we wanna know the name of the pest you're trying to treat is as specific as possible. Um, and we just, we really just need one pest name. Um, for instance, if you're making an application to a pasture or a lawn uh, and you're using a broadleaf weed killer, we know you're going to want to kill everything that's not grass out there. Um, so, but if you just list one weed name that is sufficient. And then if you're a pilot and you're making an aerial application, we need the FAA N number for your aircraft. And that is all the information. This is kind of a, a mock-up of a of TDA's record keeping form. Again, you don't have to use this, but it's available to you if you'd like to use it. Um, in this instance, this is a private applicator. So he's, he's left this part blank where it says the name of the person for whom it was made because he's doing it for himself. He doesn't have a customer. Um, he's got an address for the land location. His crop is pasture. And then below that, he's got his product trade name and his EPA registration number, his mixing rate at one pint per acre, He's using boom equipment, his name and license number, total area. And then this is that one right here where, where people get confused. They think we're asking for the total amount used. But um, in this example, he's got 10 gallons per acre and that's what we're looking for. You can always add in additional information like on this one, it has um, that there was added fertilizer and drift retardant into the tank mix. That's good information. Um, on the second entry on this page um, is a spot treatment to cactus. So they've made a note there that they have, um, they're just doing a spot treatment. And in your total area and your total volume there, that can look a little different because we do not expect you to measure each spot that you spray to come up with the total area. If you just indicate that it's a spot treatment and roughly how much you're using in your, your backpack or your pump up sprayer, uh, that will cover your total area and your volume. Okay, so that was our- uh, Sorry, Kathy, Airfon here. Yeah, go ahead. Quick question. Um, I found another similar uh, reporting form, but it's uh, from 2015. Does that mm -hmm. one have some additional information that is needed that was not needed from the form that you just showed? So I think it has like WPS handler card checkbox assigned and dated label checkbox. Uh, yeah, like so that that one is it's not necessarily needed to be recorded in that format. If if that makes sense, it's more of a on that one from 2015 that you're looking at. It's more of a a reminder checklist kind okay. of a, a form on there. Um, just to the applicator to have those items if they apply. Okay, so I've, I've added a link to that PDF in the chat for anyone who wants to use that template, but just be aware, I guess there are some things in there that are are probably still helpful, but maybe not required. So it, it doesn't hurt, I guess, to, to include yeah. those things. Right, no, and that's a good point. They, you know, if you have, and I, what you're referencing there is the, um, the section for um, verifying training of an unlicensed applicator. Correct, yep. Uh, either with a WPS handler card, which A, doesn't exist anymore <laughs> because of the right. changes yeah, to so WPS. Yeah, there'll be some things and, outdated on there as well. Yeah, yeah, they're just a little bit outdated, but um, it, it you can still, it's still a good form to use um, as kind of a checklist to say, oh yeah, I need to make sure that I have either my WPS training documents or the um, direct supervision affidavit for my untrained people. Yeah, perfect, thanks.
Thank you. Okay, so um, that was state record keeping form. If you are, if you fall under the WPS, the worker protection standard, uh, you are going to have possibly some additional record keeping to keep in mind. Um, that's going to include your training logs or your worker handler training. Uh, it's going to be additional pesticide application information, and that's uh, the information you are going to keep at your central posting area for your workers and handlers to see what kind of pesticide applications have been happening at the facility. And then if you're using or if you're using pesticides that require respirator use, you're going to have some additional respirator training and medical evaluation documents as well. So that's um, just keep that in mind if you if you qualify for WPS. Um, I've posted this pesticideresources.org down here. This is a very good website to bookmark for WPS information and training documents. And um, later on in one of the slides, I've got a hyperlink in there so we can actually get into that website and I can show you a couple of things if we have time, but um, it's, it's super good for all things WPS. So uh, we'll kind of touch on WPS right now. Um, this is one of those things we're not gonna get real deep into it. Um, I encourage anybody, if you, if you have questions or you need some clarification on this, you can uh, contact me directly and I'll have my contact info posted at the end. But basically WPS is a federal rule and it, it's a, essentially it's an occupational health rule for agricultural workers regarding pesticide use. So its purpose is to uh, inform, protect, and mitigate exposure pesticides for people working in ag agricultural establishments. So there's a couple things that have to happen in order for WPS to apply to you or your agricultural establishment. First of all, it has to be a WPS site. And those sites are farms, forests, nurseries, and greenhouses. So if you've got one of those sites, you are likely uh, going to need to comply with WPS. It also uh, has to do with a pesticide product. So your pesticide label will have an agricultural use requirement section on that label. Um, that's what makes it a WPS labeled pesticide. If it does not have that section on the label, then WPS does not apply to what you're doing. It's, it's unlikely that it won't be on the label for um, folks like yourself that are using uh, pesticides in a professional capacity. Most of the products that are not labeled for WPS are more like your homeowner ornamental type landscape products. And then of course you have to be workers present in order for the worker protection standard to um, apply. And those workers have to be employed within 30 days of your pesticide application. So if all that sounds like, like you and your establishment, then um, there's some additional responsibilities that you have. And that includes training your workers and your pesticide handlers. That training, again, can be found on that uh, PERC website. Um, and it is free training for workers and handlers that you can show them. Uh, you have to make personal protective equipment and decontamination supplies accessible to all employees. You have to have a pesticide safety information area. Um, we also call that the central posting area. That's where you hang up your WPS poster. You keep your safety data sheets for all of the pesticides that you're using at the facility. And that's where you're gonna keep your, your record of pesticide application uh, information available to the employees. There's notification requirements regarding when and where applications are taking place. And then um, if you are using respirators um, that the label requires, there's additional requirements for that. So this is that agricultural use requirement box that you'll see on your pesticide label. And again, I mean, 99% of what you're using is gonna have this. Um, uh, there may be the odd thing here or there, but I mean, even just regular Roundup has, has this on there. So um, you look at this box and it tells you in that first paragraph that you use this only in accordance with its label and the 
worker protection standard. And it goes on to tell you that you got to uh, offer decontamination and notify and provide training for your employees. One of the things you, the important things in this box is this section right here. This is where you're going to get your information about your restricted entry interval, your REI. Um, that is the interval that you want to record on your pesticide safety information documents so that your employees know not to enter these specific treated areas for that amount of time. It's also going to give you information about early entry personal protective equipment. Now in, in the instance that somebody does have to enter a treated area before the REI expires, and those are limited uh, circumstances, but if they do have to enter, they must wear the PPE that is listed on this part of the label. And it could be different PPE than what is li uh, listed in the precautionary statements in the front part of the label. Uh, so yes, that's that. There also could be a specific notification uh, requirements in this section of the label. Uh, of course, with WPS, you're doing some posting using the specific signs. Um, a lot of people will verbally tell their employees when applications are happening, um, which is fine, but some products in this section give specific double notification requirements, meaning that you must post the treated area prior to application and you must verbally tell everybody about the application happening. Okay, so these are just some images um, on the right there. That's the uh, WPS pesticide safety poster. Um, this is the newer version from the 2015 revisions. Um, if you have one of the older ones that is um, it's more orange and, and reddish, I guess, in color than, than this kind of blue and white version. You'll want to get a copy of this newer one, and that can be downloaded off Perk's website as well. Uh, over in the left corner, there is a posting sign, a WPS posting sign, and those signs must contain all of those specific components. Uh, particularly the words, the colors, those little pictograms with the face and the hand. Um, I've seen some homemade WPS signs and there's nothing wrong with making them yourself as long as they meet the standards. Um, and you can find all that in the WPS how to comply manual as far as sizing and colors and whatnot. But if it just says, you know, pesticides and use stay out, that's not gonna work. You'll want one of these signs. So again, you can make it or you can purchase it. Um, in the center there, we have uh, someone is getting a respirator fit test. Um, that's part of the additional respirator guidelines. If you're using products that require respirator use, a medical evaluation and a respirator fit test must be provided to the pesticide handler. The medical evaluation, of course, has to be done by a physician, but um, the agricultural establishment, you guys can actually do the fit testing if you order these kits that have the hood and the bitrix or the smoke, um, you can conduct those yourself. So these are just some observations that um, from my WPS inspections um, this last year, just some things that I've come across. Um, some of these are, are pretty frequent. Um, areas of non-compliance. Um, for training, we see a lot of incomplete training records. Um, they may not have the course approval number. They may not tell us who trained the person or why they were qualified, um, or they may not have done any training at all. Uh, sometimes they don't train because they're just not aware that it was required. Um, some folks are still unaware that the training requirements was increased to be done every single year. Um, prior to 2015, it was a five-year training, but it is every year now. So uh, we do see some folks who are not getting the training every year. Uh, we see incomplete pesticide application information at the central posting area. 
Um, some of those things are just uh, a lot of times we just, we won't have the EPA registration number or something like that, but sometimes it might be lacking like the uh, the start time or the end time of the application, which is important information, particularly if somebody is uh, wanting to look at that information and base uh, their activities in a particular area off of the REI. They uh, the REI won't mean much to them if they don't know what time the application started. So um, we do see that um, respirator training or medical evaluations not being provided to handlers. And again, I think that's just a lack of, uh, uh, they're just not aware that that is required now from the new 2015 revisions. Uh, not posting of treated areas. Um, we're seeing some areas where they're just, they're not posting the areas. The rule with WPS is in an um, enclosed space like a greenhouse. If the REI is over four hours, you must post every time. Um, we're seeing a lot of folks not using their signs. Um, people just not being aware of the label requirements. And this goes beyond WPS. This is just all inspections. Um, we, we see uh, with pretty routine frequency that folks just, they just don't know what the REI is. Um, they might have that it's a 12 hour REI written down in the record, but when we go look at the label that they have in storage, it's actually a 48 hour REI. Um, they don't have the correct PPE listed by the label for early entry tasks or even just uh, applications. And they're not aware of those additional notification requirements on the label. Uh, occasionally, we do we do have some instances where people are entering treated areas during applications um, because they were not aware an application was happening, and the applicator was not aware of that person being in the area. And then we just we do have a fair amount of people who are just don't know what WPS is, haven't heard of it, don't know anything about it. So again, that's why I, I beat the, the dead horse that is WPS at all of my CEU events, because I do have people saying, well, how are we supposed to know about this? Like, how am I supposed to comply with a law that I don't know anything about? So I try to get the information out there. Here is a example of a WPS uh, record keeping form, one that you would post in your central posting area. Again, this is just an example, but this has all the required information on it that you needed that central posting area. And you see it's a little, it's different than the state record keeping requirement in that it has um, the end time as well as the start time, the active ingredient of the product and the REI. This form is kind of a combo state record keeping slash WPS record keeping form. So um, if you're not using a restricted use or state limited use product and you've got a private license, you don't have to keep state records. So I'm going to go back one. Then you could just use the WPS record keeping form to be compliant with that. But if you have to be compliant with WPS and you're using a restricted pesticide, you need to keep records for both the state and the WPS. So we kind of mocked up this form to where you could accomplish both record keeping requirements on one form. Um, again, this is just an example. If somebody wants to use it as a guide, um, and I can email these to you if you like, but the red items are required by WPS only, like the active ingredient and the REI. The black items are the TDA, state record keeping requirements, and then the ones in blue are the ones that um, are required by both. Okay, so I'm gonna show you We'll get in. This is PERC, pesticideresources.org, the Pesticide Educational Resources Collaborative. Very good website for WPS. Um, let's see if it'll let me share that. You guys can see that. So, this is PERC's website. 
Uh, sorry, we're still seeing just your PowerPoint. You're just seeing my PowerPoint. Bummer. Okay, so um, let me you could try like unsharing and resharing. It might be that you're sharing just the PowerPoint app rather than your desktop. Oh, that might be right. Okay. Well, let's see. Let me just squeeze that on the clip. That. We'll just leave it at that. Anyway, um, you can write down this website. Like I said, I think it's a good idea to um, bookmark it. It's, um, it's got your training materials. If you need to get a trainer trained or if you need to train workers or handlers, it's all there. Um, it's got a whole section on respirator requirements. So if you need clarification on that, um, that's available to you. Um, super easy to use. You can download and print posters from there as well. And then there's EPA's website, of course, which has the full WPS rule. Um, if there's any updates to the rule, um, which there was a, a recent update that hasn't gone into effect yet regarding the application exclusion zone, which is basically keeping people out of the application area. Um, if you'll recall uh, from the 2015 revision, they added in this application exclusion zone, which means if you are making an application, during the application, you are required to keep people out of the application area. Say if it's a ground application, you got to keep them out of the area up to 25 feet from the equipment. And that 25 feet would extend into other properties. Like say, if you're making an application 10 feet from your fence line, and there's somebody standing on a neighboring property that's within that application exclusion zone, you are responsible for stopping the application and making sure that they get out of there. Well, uh, EPA has decided that that is unreasonable for the applicator and unenforceable for the uh, state regulators. So um, those application exclusion zones do not extend beyond your property anymore. But those kind of updates can be found on EPA's website. You can also get training material there. Um, I just find that that Perks website is is much more user friendly as far as those items go. Okay, so we're going to talk just a little bit about labeling. Um, of course, the labels are on your containers, and that's you. We all know that we have to read the label first, and that the label is the law. Um, it's good to know that labeling can include other items that are not just limited to what's on your container. So um, this is EPA's definition of labeling, meaning that it can include any printed or graphic material prepared by the registrant to accompany the pesticide, including references cited on a label or accompanying material. So, and that can include additional labels. It can include a website that you have to get on and view or additional pamphlets. Um, the important thing is just remembering to read that container label back and forth, make sure that you're following everything on there and any additional material as well. So these are just the basic parts that are required to be on all labels. Um, you will recognize these. Uh, this is not exactly in the order that they are in the label, but most pretty much every pesticide label, if you've looked at one, you, you know what's going to follow it because they're all organized the same. And then, of course, everything's going to have a signal word, um, caution being the lowest uh, toxicity warning, and then danger, which will be the highest toxicity um, regarding exposure to the product. And some of those danger products might also have the word poison on it as well, if there's real acute toxicity involved. So these are just a couple of um, examples um, regarding additional labeling materials like this. Uh, this is just an example of the Ingenia herbicide uh, section 24C label. This is a special local need label. So it's an additional label because there was a um, additional registration and it, it's a limited registration as you can see for this particular one, it's only for use in North Carolina. When they have certain pest problems, that they're having trouble controlling, um, a state or a registrant might um, 
ask EPA to give them some additional uh, registration buffers that's outside of the normal label. So they'll issue these special local need labels. And it says on this label that you must read this label in addition to the container label. And the extend -a max label over here, this is one of those that has a website um, that you are required to view before the applications um, because the website has uh, more up-to-date information regarding training and laws and regs and application uh, directions for these particular products. So that's just an example of some of those products that have additional materials that you're still required to read as well. And of course, I'm putting this in here about personal protective equipment because this is just a common non-compliance thing I see quite a bit where um, folks are overlooking some personal protective equipment. Um, if you are familiar with Trimec or three-way or speed zone, that's a real common broadleaf herbicide used in ornamental turf. Very, very frequently um, I do inspections as very widely used and the label requires a chemical resistant apron like the fella on the right there is wearing. And I would say 90% of the, the folks I point that out to and do inspections with are not aware and they don't have that chemical resistant apron. Um, so that's just to drive home the point of making sure you're reviewing your labels. Um, if you use the same products over and over again, it's a good idea to read the label every time you get a new jug because the labels do change. Um, and of course you want to make sure that you are protected and you are not risking any unnecessary exposure. Okay, and just to, we'll just do a couple slides on disposal. Um, most important things about disposal is again, read the label. Um, it's usually at the, the back part of the label will tell you specifically how to rinse and dispose of your pesticide containers. Um, once your containers are rinsed, that rinse water needs to be either just put back into your application tank or applied to a labeled site. And then you want to cut them usually and put them in the garbage that way nobody can dig them out of the garbage and refill, try to refill them with drinking water or something. And then of course, do not burn your empty pesticide containers. Um, that's not uh, something we necessarily regulate, but TCEQ fines uh, may result in burning of pesticide containers. So TDA has uh, done three of these pesticide collection disposal days now. Um, our most recent one was in October in Lubbock. And it's, it's basically, it's just a one day event where anybody uh, from the agricultural industry can come in and drop off any old unwanted um, unused pesticides or pesticide containers um, for free. So um, it's a really great event because if you've ever tried to dispose of these types of products um, through a private company, it can be pretty cost prohibitive. So they uh, collected uh, 274,521 pounds of pesticide waste material, including some real interesting older materials. Um, this is just a breakdown. You can see the, the bulk of it was just small containers, small loose pack containers, either liquids or solids. So these are some things that showed up to this event. That's a combination 2,4-D, 2,4-5-T. Um, you won't find that anymore uh, for distribution for good reason. Uh, here's a couple of versions of chlordane uh, termiticides which you will also not find available anymore. And anytime you see a glass jug, that's, that's usually an indication you're dealing with something um, that you may not come across very frequently. This uh, sodium cyanide balls for red ants, as that was a new one to me. I've never, I've never seen a product to kill ants that was sodium cyanide based. So, 
And then this is the total. That's all the stuff that was dropped off in that one day event. So these are good events. I've, I've been told that the next disposal event is they're looking towards East Texas um, for this. I don't know where or when. Um, that's just the information they gave me. So as soon as they um, get those things scheduled, I'll, I'll certainly let Airfon know and um, the other extension agents in the area will get that information out. So if you do have, if you're sitting on some old stuff that um, you'd like to get rid of, this is a good opportunity um, to do it. Okay, so here is my real brief um, information about phytosanitary certificates. So um, basically, if you're, if you're going to ship any plant material or soil out of state, um, and there, there could be a quarantine in place, um, you're going to need a phytosanitary certificate. So the process for getting one of those is to call our region office, and that's the phone number right there. You can ask for either Amador Hernandez or Gary Stewart. Um, they are the heads of this um, program in Dallas. And the information they're going to need from you, they're going to want to know what you're shipping and where you're shipping it to. And they may direct you to the National Plant Board uh, website, which um, there is a link down here. It's, you can access it through our website. Um, if you go to texasagriculture.gov on the quarantine page, there's a link for the National Plant Board. And on that website, it's just a PDF of each state's uh, quarantine rules. So you can click on those and it will give you your product and the, the quarantine states. And then that will kind of let you know if you need the certificate or not. If you do, then um, you will get with Amador or Gary at our office and they will schedule a time for an inspector to come out to your facility to get you that certificate. And they, they usually need about a week's notice. So, um, you know, if you're trying to ship something tomorrow and get that certificate before that, um, that's really not going to be enough time to get an inspector out there. So make sure you give them enough time to get that scheduled. Um, there is a inspection fee of $30 for these phytosanitary certificates. Um, and it's just it's just thirty dollars for the inspection, no matter how many shipments to multiple states you have going out. It's just thirty dollars for the inspection. Um, outside of that, I don't have a whole lot more information about that. I hope that that kind of maybe answered some questions about the process for getting those done. Um, if you have any additional questions, uh, Amador and Gary are really good resources in our Dallas office for that. Um, but that is about all I have for laws and regs today. So there's my contact information. If you, um, I'm happy to take phone calls or emails and answer questions anytime. So, uh, if you've got something, just let me know. Um, if there's any questions right now, um, we can answer those if any have come up. Thank you so much, Kathy. Uh, so far, I've been kind of scanning uh, the chat. Most of the questions have been um, just almost like administratively related. So I've been kind of answering them as they come along. But okay. if anyone has any other questions specific to Kathy, right now would be a good time to ask. At the same time, while that's going on, I am going to, uh, let's see, share the end survey. So if you are, uh, again, looking for uh, CEUs, whether that be TNLA CEUs, or if you're needing uh, the pesticide applicator TDA CEUs, make sure you complete that survey. Um, it's both in the chat, or you can use this QR tag right there to find it. Uh, even if you don't need CEUs, please complete that survey. That's how we measure impact, knowing how to improve our programs and uh, really help us to be able to do future programming like this as well. So if there are any questions for Kathy, you can either unmute yourself or uh, write it in the chat and uh, I can, I can um, bring it up to Kathy. 
Uh, TNLA is the Texas Nursery and Landscape Association. So if you're a member of that association, they do have some uh, certification programs that requires some continuing education units. So if you're not familiar with TNLA, you probably do not need their CEUs. Uh, how it might be here about the pesticide drop off in the future. So how is that typically advertised or broadcast? As far as I know, um, the one that I attended was in Coriel County uh, last summer. And I believe that they were kind of relying on the extension agents in the counties that the drop off was surrounding to send out email blasts to their folks. Um, so what I would recommend is if you are not already on your county extension agents email list to add yourself to that because um, they'll give you lots of information uh, as far as CEU programs as well. But um, that that is my understanding. I don't know. This is it's kind of a pilot program. Um, like I said, they've only done three. So the one in Lubbock, they may have had some other cut. They had a huge turnout at that one in Lubbock and it may just be the region but um, they may have also had more advertising about it, just letting people know about it. But definitely uh, your county agents. I also have um, an email list, my six legged aggie.com. And on the right side, you'll see to join a, a, a listserv. So if I hear of something like that, I'll be sure to broadcast it as well. So just make sure you're connected with your county agents, extension personnel, they'll um, certainly notify you one way or another. Uh, I have another question that came in through uh, private chat asking the TDA has an accessible database uh, that records the CUs for them to look up. So I guess it's one way of, of making sure their CUs have been submitted or, or seeing if they're up to date. I am not aware of a database that's accessible by applicators for that. So um like, and, and the question is meaning like, so they could verify that that they attended and the rosters were sent in, I suppose? That's that's what I, as I understand the question, yes. Okay, no, I, I, I'm not aware that there is one of those. So when you, um, and you know, I'm not exactly sure how with the online live courses, you guys are doing rosters, but um, the rosters do get sent in like by Airfon or the other county agents or presenters and that gets sent to TEA, but I don't think that they're on a database. The best thing you can do is just hang on to your certificates that show um, the course number you took and the credits that you earn. That's right. So anyone who's, again, if you filled out the, the, the form at the beginning and the survey here at the end, uh, within a week's time, because I have to basically make all these certificates and I have these webinars daily, and I'll only send you that certificate uh, once I've confirmed that roster and sent it into TDA. So if you do not receive a certificate within about a week or, or within two weeks at latest, and you believe that you did sign up for pesticide applicator CUs, you can contact me. At the same time, anyone who's kind of just registered has clicked yes to you know wanting CUs, but did not put in their license number or has some missing information. I plan on contacting you and letting you know that you know, you had an intent to get the CEUs, but your information was incomplete. So you will be contacted um, for the most part, one way or another, if you have filled out those forms and shown some interest in getting CEUs. Are there any other questions? All right. Well, again, thank you so much, Kathy. I want to thank you so much for your time. Always a, a great pleasure having you at our program. Well, thank you for having me again. And I appreciate the online format as well. So yeah, you guys got something out of it. And um, if you need clarification or have questions, just let me know. Yeah. All right. Thank you. And again, I want to thank our co-sponsor, uh, Tina Lay, for this webinar series. Do check out, uh, let's see, this Friday, we have Suzanne Wainwright that's going to be talking about incorporating beneficial insects or natural enemies into greenhouse horticultural production. So that should be quite interesting. You can register for that one at the six and under programs. We also do have, there's a team of us, a uh, multidisciplinary team that uh, tackles different green industry related challenges 
uh, for you know green industry folks in Texas. This is called Chat with Green Aggies. We do this every Thursday at 12, 12 p.m. So if you're not familiar with that one yet, go on to Facebook and look for Chat with Green Aggies. We have a Facebook page there and those webinars are advertised there. Thanks again so much for joining in and please make sure again to fill, uh, fill out that survey. That'd be greatly appreciated. And we'll see y'all at the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you.